Whenever Leo Dennis Kolowski visited Harvard Business School, he got standing ovations. Even before he started speaking, the students would clap and cheer for him. They hung on his every word. They took notes about his methodology and how he structured his deals. They studied the way Dennis reshaped Tyco International, a $400 million security company, into a $40 billion acquisitions machine. Under Dennis, Tyco slayed over 3,000 alarm, safe, and sprinkler companies and absorbed them into Tyco. But let's be real about college students. It takes more than a good resume to impress them. Want to know the real reason they cheered to see a hairless, egg-shaped Monopoly man standing at the head of the classroom? In the late 90s, when Dennis Kozlowski was giving talks at Harvard Business, he was the highest paid CEO in the country. During his last four years at Tyco, Dennis raked in $300 million. Imagine sitting in a business school hearing, okay class, we have a special guest speaker. It's deal a day Dennis, the highest paid CEO in America. And he's about to tell you how to earn 75 million a year. Wouldn't you cheer? Those applause, the respect and admiration from students and peers, that's what kept Dennis going in prison. In his 10 by 10 cell, where he wasn't allowed a cellmate, because killing the highest paid CEO in America would have been big bragging rights. So alone, on his bunk, Dennis dreamed about those applause, the cheers, the admiration. That was before he was given the nickname Piggy by Wall Street magazines, before he would spend nine years in a correctional facility for organizing his own unauthorized bonuses, which exceeded $80 million. $80 million, a heinous, jaw-dropping crime back in 2005 when he was convicted. By the way, Tim Cook, the current CEO of Apple, receives a pay package of $99 million. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then, we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no duh on the internet. On past episodes of The Reengineered You, we've talked extensively about what wealth and power does to your mind. In our Celebrity Insulation episode, we discovered that excessive wealth calluses us emotionally and stunts social growth. In our episode about FDR and stress, we discovered high-powered leaders struggle to empathize with subordinates, that their ability to recognize emotional states in others dropped as their power accelerates. In our episode about intelligence, we found it better financially to have high social conscientiousness quotient rather than a genius IQ. In short, money is good. Enough to get above the happiness index is better. The kind of money that pays your grandchildren's education, that's the best. But when we start throwing around hundreds of millions, we become a target. We isolate ourselves. And if our fortune can be blamed on luck or timing, we can run the risk of imposter syndrome. We're going to get to our myth. Could you even call having Bruce Wayne billions a problem? What's wrong with CEO's ego that they need all that cash anyway? And if you're a CEO, how do you live in the world where everyone sees you as a walking dollar sign? But before we just start feeling too sorry for these poor, lonely CEOs, I want to tell Joe how Dennis Kolinsky justified his stupid, huge bonuses. Uh, Joe, you and I both talk a lot about social class, and we've studied it, and we, we talk about it on the show and in our speeches. Um, we talk a lot about minimum wage and poverty and slavery in the world today. Now we're on the other extreme. <laughs> so we've gone to the making $30 a month to the $30 billion a year. I've been waiting to get to the other extreme. I didn't know we'd be looking at Dennis doing it, but I'm, <laughs> I've been waiting for this part. The, I, I want the, what is it, the, the pool full of money and the, the tigers and sleeping on, on cash. I'm ready. 
Well, we did the a Wall Street one, and we talked about Dick Fooled of Lehman Brothers, and he learned earned a half a billion dollars in about an eight year period in a company that he ran that had been a generational business in, in a very high profit margin business. He ran into the ground under his leadership, but somehow felt it was okay to still take half a billion dollars. But I want to talk about some of the other CEOs out there so we can kind of put this into perspective on uh, on Dennis. Um, Tim Cook, um, the, the Apple makes about $98 million a year in salary. Now, uh, quick, my question to you is, the, the first argument we came across in our last episode about CEOs is, is it justified? Uh, a lot of companies say that they have to pay extraordinarily crazy rates to, to the point where it is no longer something that they will ever spend in their lifetime. Like, it's beyond what anything touching human needs or necessities. And they say they have to do that because um, it keeps them competitive. Like, it... it it incentivizes the best CEO to, to step in that position. Do you believe that? This is what I really, well, this, I know, and this is what I don't believe. You know, Tim Cook got the keys to the car from Steve Jobs, right? Right. You know, and just like uh, Steve Ballmer got the keys to the car at Microsoft. You know that that stuff was already, they, they, didn't, they didn't take them, and they've been there for a long time, and they've helped them get to that point, but it isn't really safe to say that. <laughs> That they're that they're worth that much to the company that if some other CEO came in from let's just say Starbucks or from anybody from Walmart wherever wouldn't do the exact same job would you agree with that? I used to not agree with that. Like I okay, I'm gonna push back a little bit. I still believe it is such a niche skill, niche job, niche like study your whole life for it. Be extraordinarily um, diligent to get it. Like I, I still believe it's a job that nobody really can do. Except these people, but I now that I have uh, in our Dickfold and Charisma episode, we ran across a really good study from Germany that was all about how um, basically it was almost incidental that the CEOs that their charisma or their leadership ability translated into a successful business. Like I used to think that every company was tied to its CEO. Now I just think a strong company is a strong company, and their decision making, the, what the CEO does is almost incidental sometimes. So, I've almost yeah. come around on this. And I, and, and I, you know, we watch a lot of speeches and we read a lot of, you know, nonfiction stuff. I just don't find these people to be that dynamic, Joe. That no. <laughs> that I'm going to go work for them because it's Tim Cook, or you know, I still think they're working for the brand. A couple other ones too. Uh, you know, John Donahue, is Nike here in Beaverton. He's 32 million. I have met him. Nice guy. He's got that George Washington thing going on. He's like seven foot two tall. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? The tallest man in the room, you know, it's always the boss kind of thing. And I hate to say men to be sexist, but that seems to be the case a lot of times, right? Do you think that's what it is? Do you think it's like, are CEOs actually steering the company as much as they think? Or do you think it's like, I mean, like, um, I listened to the Freakonomics series on, on CEOs and... I know some of them are very dynamic and they actually do steer things, but I'm starting to think a lot of them just kind of like nod, listen to smart people, and then just like press the yes button. Like it, it really feels like that to me. We're going to go further down the line here. Um, so Boeing CEO David Kyle making airplanes $21 million a year. This one kind of surprised me. Ramon L Lagarta of Pepsi, which is just sugar water, and he does twenty. He only makes twenty million. So you start to get callous to these two. Like he only makes twenty million dollars a year. Only, yeah, <laughs> only twenty million. But you think of those kind of margins, right? I mean, they're selling nothing for five bucks. You know, that doesn't think it doesn't cost anybody. And let's go. Let's get more, even more human here. And by more human, I mean the Costco one. Craig, I can't. Zelnick makes eight point five. I kind of see him as a. Um, as a Warren Buffett type, right? Yeah. You know, he, he's got his money kind of other places. You know, and Warren Buffett's at the bottom of the list here at, at 373000 <laughs> But we all know that isn't what he makes. So that that makes me wonder what all these people really make if Warren Buffett's saying he only makes $370,000. Right, yeah. Uh, if you 
I, I'm sure that everything he has is wrapped up in shares and stocks and that his real value is, you know, annual income is measurably higher than that if you just take into account what he's, you know, dealing in. Do you... And so aren't these other people's. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he's not alone, so. What do you, th- what's the, the Costco exclusive brand? It's not Kroger, it's... Um... Kirkland. Kirkland. Do you think that he, he the CEO wears Kirkland brand suits? <laughs> That's when I know you're officially no longer a sex object is when you start getting your clothes from Costco. <laughs> when your wife picks your clothes out. It's no longer a fashion statement. It's like she buys them out of that big pile and can hold the hands them off to you. Right. <laughs> so, no. He still wears Armani's and all that. Yeah. It's uh, the, the good life. Yeah. Well, we discussed um, last episode about stock buybacks and how CEOs are compensated, like what what their wealth actually looks like, um, and the problem with with a stock buyback, like why that kind of incentive doesn't necessarily mean that you know you you pay them that much, you give them you you incentivize a CEO to make the stocks worth a lot, but you don't incentivize them to make sure the company's doing well or that they're contributing to America. So now we're going to get into um, the part where we talk about like all these all these high paid CEOs Todd just listed off. We're going to talk about what separates them mentally, because we we want to keep asking the question in different ways: Can we be wealthy CEOs, I- imperial CEOs? And the reason we keep asking that is because we are, or at least started as ostensibly a self help podcast, and at the root of self help is. You know, uh, all these books say we're going to make you a success. We're going to make you into a company running, you know, um, found your own success, bootstrap your way to millions kind of person. Um, Steve, uh, Steve Seibold, the author of How Rich People Think, had a heck of a lot to say about how millionaires value or think about. Um, so I think we kind of, if you're okay with it, I just kind of want to start there. Um, oh, please, please. I like that. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Oh, and, and, Right before we get into that, uh, I had somebody, I was talking to um, a couple of friends about um, doing this episode about CEO millionaires. And the first thing uh, out of one of the researchers' mouth that I talked to is um, they all inherited, that they they inherited enough money to get started. And that's not necessarily true. I I looked that up specifically. Um, We'll link off to the data for that. But 80% of millionaires didn't inherit it. Uh, they actually worked for it. They, um, 80% of them um, did not start with the money they ended up with, not even close. Like, they, they start out with middle-class money. However, I will put a big, fat however in front of this. Eight, I was gonna, yeah. 88% go <laughs> of them did graduate college. So the key difference yeah. is they didn't start off millionaires, but they did have opportunities, college being one of them. So I will say. And I, and I see this as, as a... You know, a kid who grew up playing sports. Not that I was very good at any of them, but the 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 people who are real successful uh, in the, in the athletic world, yeah, their parents didn't have a lot of money, but their parents were all in. Yeah, on their kids' athleticism, and and that includes paying for it. You know, investing every you know every every drop of blood they had in their kid to get them to that level. So it's like, well, our parents didn't have anything. It's true. <laughs> right. They had equipment and coaching and, and mentoring and, you know, professionals yeah. and, and camps and yeah. An obsession, an obsession to get their kids to where they are. Right. Exactly. A lot of these CEOs, when we say that 88% of them started with degrees, that's not just their parents got them to college. That's their parents got them the kind of mentoring extra information. Like we, we've, you and I've talked about how, was it um, was it Steve Jobs or Bill Gates started with a a a the first computer available to any human being was like yeah. in front of him it was, as a teenager. It was Bill. It was it was Bill Gates. He Thank was you. yeah. He was you know in, in in I think it was middle school and and his mom was very big in the community in Seattle as a you know, volunteer and uh, her, his dad was a successful attorney so he had all day access to the only computer in the West Coast. Right. <laughs> Maybe the only one in America at a very young age. And Steve Jobs was next door neighbors with Hewlett and Packard right. as a boy. <laughs> Hewlett and Packard were his neighbors. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, when we talk about opportunity, these CEOs, when they when they all say, I did it myself, I bootstrapped my way up, they, they did for the money, but when we're talking just opportunity, they had opportunity. 
Um, do you think Hewlett and Packard was with Steve Jobs like, hey, you little fuck, get off my lawn? <laughs> you know, hey, don't. <laughs> You know what I mean? And then they said, oh, that guy's going to be worth more than you guys someday. And said, that little shithead? No, never. <laughs> There's no way they thought he was going to, either one of them were going to lead the world in computers. <laughs> Zero chance they thought that. I will say, though, that um, at, uh, I'll, I'll take the Dale Carnegie side of this, which is they probably just show genuine interest and people are flattered by that. So if a kid comes over and is like, hey, everything you do in life I love, you're going to tell them how to do it. You're going to be like, okay, sit at the computer, kid. Have fun. Yeah. And to be fair, right, I, I think there were other kids that were neighbors of Hewlett and Packard, too. And the same with um, – there were other parents who had um, had, a, had esteem in, in Seattle, and their kids weren't interested in computers. They just, like you said, no genuine interest. So right. let's give credit where credit's due, right? Exactly. So uh, last episode – I kind of talked about how millionaires think. Todd mentioned that you know they they seem streetwise, and that's what Steve Seibold, the author of How Rich People Think, that's what he really hammers on in his book. He he says over and over again, millionaires aren't geniuses. They're not extra smart. They're extra savvy to the point where the way Todd said it is perfect. That's their sport. Like they are so good at being savvy in business and and street smart and clever that they they have mastered the game um and i think it's i think it's tough competing with all those other ivy league high achievers i mean let's face it just swimming those shark infested waters in a corporate world is you'd have to be savvy you'd have to you know yeah to dodge and weave a few shots here and there it's it's uh, to to my uh, i come from a, a labor family and so to my brain it's it's they're the like a master woodworker will make you know, like you spend your whole life getting so good that you can make um, something that is prized by people and passed down to the family. And that's how you make money. These people, their, their master craft that they've honed is dodging the corporate world. It's it's swimming through those waters, those the shark infested waters. That is that is their athletic sport. That's their craft. That's that's everything for them. And they they build their mind to look for opportunities. That's that's the savviness is they they look for opportunities Every day, all day, they, they build a, a net in their brain that catches opportunities. Uh, I'm going to quote um, Steve Seibold here. He says, If the key to building wealth was excellent grades in school, every summa cum laude college grad would be a, they'd be rich. Amassing money has more to do with street smart and savvy than your ability to memorize information and excel on exams. So they're more concerned about building good teams. You said that last episode, and that's... That's something I've only gotten wise to in my adult years is if you want to be successful and CEOs know this, we found this out in our intelligence episode when we when we talked about social conscientiousness, how it's worth more just dollar for dollar than IQ. Honestly, CEOs know this. They, they are more concerned about building good teams. That is social conscientiousness. And I think they I think they knew that before they went to Harvard, too. Yeah, I think that's their inborn skill, honestly. I they, yeah, I think it's already in their DNA, and they just they just, they just just know how to do that. Basketball players are born tall. Good CEOs are born communicating. They're, they're born knowing to network with people and build good teams. Um, yeah, there's, there's, we're going to cover in our third part uh, about CEOs uh, a guy named Dan Price, and he grew up in a Christian community, and he joined a Christian rock band, and everywhere they toured, he kept track of the people... Uh, the the shops and the coffee shops and the little stages they played, he kept track of every single one of the people he played with. Like like every every one of those shops, he kept track of the managers and the coffee shop owners, and he contacted them after he got out of being in a Christian band, and he started representing them with like credit card debt and like helping them get out of debt. So like, yeah, these people are built with a mechanism in their brain to to build teams and to network. So it it really is their their sport. Um, uh, he, uh, Seibold says, quote, or Steve says, quote, the world class knows it takes a team to build wealth and they focus much more of their effort on finding the right people to leverage their actions and ideas. Money flows from ideas and problem solving. He writes, the bigger the solution, the bigger the paycheck. So yeah, they, they network, they listen to people and when they see a problem they can solve and it's worth something to somebody else, they solve it and they, they cash that check. 
do you think when they hear jackasses like us talk about how you know they this that we're simplifying and they think guys kids you don't know how much work this was <laughs> you don't know who i had to kill sleep with <laughs> claw scrape <laughs> Because we do, we focus on the end, and we don't focus on the. And I'm going to touch on that a little later. Yeah, I I agree with that. Uh, I think that when we when we talk about CEOs, a lot of our talk ends up being about money. But I I think the who you know the the journey there. I mean, it's it's like Game of Thrones. That's that's what happens in the boardroom over enough time is you have so much drama, so many decisions a day. I mean, like you have to do so much that it you, and the. And the camaraderie of, of who to team up with and who to, I mean, they have a lot of loyal uh, soldiers on their team and women that have helped them that they wouldn't be there without. Right. I mean, I remember very clearly Bill Gates giving this speech about Steve Ballmer. And, and I don't think, of, I think Bill Gates is about as emotional as Joe here, not very much, right? And he was crying talking about Steve Ballmer, all he's done for him. And it just shocked me. Yeah. This is when Ballmer was retiring. And I thought, whoa, I guess you don't think of it like that. Right. Like, I, I wouldn't be a billionaire, trillionaire without these other dudes. Right. That's that's ultimately what our episode today is about, is they're not thinking about the money. They're thinking about the camaraderie, what they're building, what they're working on. Uh, that's something they um, Steve says in his book is, you know, it, it's about fulfillment. Focus on the work that has the most fulfilling potential. You know, once you find that fulfillment, invest so much heart and soul into the work that it becomes your you're the most competent person in your field. And he says, you'll be rewarded with uncommon wealth. And that's, that really seems to be for me, like the way I understand CEOs now is that sentence. It's, they do something fulfilling. They pour their brain, heart, soul, mind, like everything they have becomes about that thing. They're paid very, very well to focus on it that hard and to make it their life. And at the end of the day, the money is a score. It's a metric. It, it's not, you know, it no longer becomes about safety or security like the rest of us, like yeah. us poor peons and mortals. Money is is how we not die when we don't have the right kind of medical coverage. For them, it is simply just a metric, uh, a, a scoring device. Like like when you're playing Yahtzee, it's it's the number scratched down to tell them how good they did, and that's going to come up in later. Ep- like um, we're going to get into studies about how the fears of the super rich work. And that's that's the thing that comes up over and over again is they really do look at it as this is the score card that gives you dopamine. That's all money is really. It's it's how you build your bunkers and buy your yachts. But those are just sort of like those are metrics of your success. The real thing you're focusing on is what you're doing day to day, what the fulfillment is, the people that are helping you, you know, changing the world literally with decisions at the boardroom. So I I am not if you've listened to past episodes I almost sound anti-capitalist when I talk. <laughs> this is so I, I hope this doesn't come off as me um, waxing poetic about CEOs and and glorifying them for one episode, but it really does take a different kind of mind to do a lot of what they do. Um, so I I think you're doing okay. You're walk you're walking the line here. You're flirting with that. You're flirting yeah. with the the CEO worship though. You're starting to. <laughs> You, you, you're forgetting some of the breaks, too, and the blessings that these people have had. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, they had a lot of opportunity, uh, and, and they network, and a lot of people they network with, they reach a hand down, and they pull them up. Um, so I'm gonna, I am I found a, a pretty good Atlantic article uh, written by Michael Norton, and he is a Harvard Business School professor who backs up a lot of what um, we're talking about. He says two central questions that people ask themselves when you know determining if they're satisfied Am I doing better than I was before? And am I doing better than other people? So when we talk about, like, Piggy, this, um, you know, uh, Dennis Kozlinski, uh, Kozlowski, the, you know, the guy that cheated Wall Street before the 2008 crash. So, like, he cheated Wall Street at a time where it was obvious and people cared. Um, But like Todd said at the beginning... He cheated Wall Street for less than an amount that we currently pay in bonuses to the CEO of Apple. So, like, if that puts it into perspective, we we went from this guy's a monster, let's lock him up for several years, to nobody cares. Like, the CEOs get paid an amount that is embarrassing to the nation. Um, but uh, Michael Norton in this article tried to sort of clear that up. 
Um, he said the reason why they pursue money be, as hard as they do. What's that? It's got to be painful though when you're in jail and you're thinking, I wasn't the only one doing this. Why did they? Why is my me? You know, right? Because I was the loudest, pounded on my chest. Well, well, I'll tell you why in a little bit. Why? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's a little bit of a teaser, but yeah, why him is a that's that's the question we want to get to eventually. But so Norton and his colleagues went through two thousand people who have a net worth of at least one million, and they were just asking um, uh, on a scale of one to ten, how much more money would it take to make them a ten on happiness? Like, you know, how much money would it take to make you the most happy? All the way up the income spectrum. And he said that everyone says, quote, basically everyone says they'd need two or three times as much. So it doesn't matter how much money they had. They always said they'd need two times as much or three times as much as what they had already. So that's funny. You think it would stop, though. You think it's, you know, when you make 20,000, if I made 60,000, if I made 120, I'd be fine. You think that would stop at some point, but it just never does. Right. I think lottery winners learn that is it's not about the number you have right now. It's about your ability to get more like you're uh, to to break this down into um, mortal terms or, or non serfdom terms for my brain. Um, I get excited when, you know, I get a, a new Xbox or, or, you know, a new game station or like for, for me, it's it's a, a really good computer. Like every every couple of years when I upgrade computers, I'm very excited because it is. You know, three times faster than the one I had before, or, or double the speed, or something. Um, for th- these people, for high power CEOs, they are motivated to make money in a way that it multiplies their current fortune. Uh, they said in this article, "quote Every billionaire I've spoken to, and uh, and I've spoken to quite a number of them, is extremely excited by each additional increment of money they make." So they compete against one another, and it's not about the money they currently have. It's not about the success or the financial security they currently have. It's always about the one-upsmanship, getting another increment more, getting another 50% more, or, you know, making deals that, that get them another large share more. It's, it's not about security. It is about scorekeeping, and it's a personal value. Like, just pretend for a moment that your skill in life is getting money, not making a, a, you know, well, I mentioned woodworking. So, like, what if your skill in life isn't you have a master work sitting in front of you or a book at the end of the day? What if your best score or your best metric is, I make money, here's my pile of money, here's my actual numbered score. Um, I don't know how I would deal with that mentally. <laughs> I, know what you're, I know what you're saying, though. You're, you're, yeah. It isn't stuff, and it isn't. And that's why it's so, so, sometimes you start to get the stuff instead of just having a, a, a dog from the pound you have to get that dog from france that's right and then you have to get that dog that's a special breed from england that's you know what i mean you just you just got to get more creative because you can't get that the mansion the jets become these hundred million dollar ones because <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with the 30 million you just you're trying to get that same feeling that joe gets when he buys a new computer right yeah uh, our our ceo piggy he could have gotten through on life with just a couple of million for the next, you know, so many years. Like, like if, if somebody in my position in, you know, like the real, real life in the real world, if they just had a decent house paid off, they would be set for life. Like they, they would just work casually for, you know, for food and for utilities and for taxes. But like, once you get past to the point where money is, is a necessity, it becomes your value. It becomes the score of you, which is crazy to think about. That it's like playing a video game where, like, you, you play a game that keeps the score up in the top right corner as you sort of, like, jump on, on enemies and shoot stuff. That's the scorecard for these people. And I'm not making this up, by the way. There's a, um, a book called Lake of Success. And he said, in, in this book, he said, Quote, they'd compete against one another on their Bloomberg terminals all day. And at the end of the day, they would play competitive poker against each other. And he said the spirit of one-upsmanship pervaded even the donations they made to charities. Um, so he thinks that, like, their their competition, like, hedge fund managers can get rich from making one or two bets a day that have more to, lo- to do with luck than anything else. So if you th- if you can basically say that you know, my skill sometimes is just luck, then the money is your score of, of how successful you are. 
Um, the, the author goes on to say, you know, he, he was interviewing one of these these brokers who was worth millions. And he, he said that he would oftentimes hear this guy and a couple other, you know, of his friends say, you know, we don't have bestsellers lists and book awards. They don't have trophies on their table, you know, promoting any other skill they have. What we have at the end of the day is this. It's the money scorecard. I see that in sports a lot with you, especially the NFL quarterbacks and, and MLB baseball players. They, When it comes down to contract negotiations, and these, these men are already very, very wealthy and very famous and have lots of sponsors and more money than they could probably even spend, uh, they always hit this nerve and they always say, this is my livelihood. And they say it in a way, Joe, like you would think that they were living paycheck to paycheck. Right, like they're a lumberjack. And they, and they negotiate. <laughs> Yeah, they negotiate like it really is, and you just think, are they this delusional? But it's kind of what you said. It, it's not. Um, it's their reality. Is is it's a score? It's a. I used to think it's the ego, but they really do think that these are genuine. Right, that number tells them how valuable their throwing arm is. Like it, it is so much. Yeah, it's. And 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 they still need that. They, it's not just about the money. They just they need to, to know that they're the best and that they're the highest paid. Right. As um, as a writer who engages in, uh, I do mostly short stories that are um, for competitions, and that's my metric, and I, I take a lot of value from that. But I realized reading this, I'm like, oh, if I didn't have that, if my scorecard wasn't, you know, knowing the percentage that I came in for a, a contest season, my scorecard would be money. Like like literally, it is for most people. If you if you're already comfortable and you have your your house paid off and you have your utilities covered and and your basic necessities are covered, the rest is just scorekeeping for yourself, and that doesn't make you happy. Wouldn't it be weird? Wouldn't it be weird to have a spouse or a parent that that earns thirty million dollars? I mean, you see them in the kitchen and you're eating cereal. I mean, wouldn't you look at them a little differently? Like there, there she goes off to work, right. <laughs> the, the cash cow herself. <laughs> There goes the breadwinner. Right. I'll just yeah. She hops into the helicopter. Would that be? But would that be a trip? I think. Wow. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, it's it's funny you say that because we we will run into how lonely that is. That you have to find somebody else doing, who who has the same scorecard basically. If we want to simplify relationships for the super wealthy, you have to find somebody who is on the scoreboard like you. Otherwise, you end up with. Exactly what Todd is describing in a very uncomfortable, you know, a, a, an insulating and isolating dichotomy. Like we, we had a celebrity insulation episode where we realized that the more money you have, the more you instinctively isolate yourself from other people. You buy a house that is in the woods or, or you buy a mansion on the hill or you, you put large fences up. Like we naturally isolate ourselves for comfort, but socially what it does is it stunts us. Um. Uh, the author of this book uh, said that, too. He said, here are people who could purchase anything they ever wanted, and they weren't content. The, the pleasures of consumption wear off through time, and they depend heavily on one's frame of reference. So exactly what you're saying. It's, you know, if, if you don't have a spouse doing the same, then you're going to be lonely. So keeping in mind that a lot of these CEOs... They are scorekeeping for themselves. That's that's effectively what the money is. They have to spend that. Like like, it's not just scorekeeping. You have to tell other people what your score is. Otherwise, there's there's no point to having that high score. You you in a video game, you brag about your score. You say, you know, did you see me playing Halo last night? I got you know a triple kill or whatever. How did the piggy of Wall Street not just get caught but show off his score? Like what 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 built his infamy? I, to take you back, uh, Kozlinski, uh, Dennis, and he got nicknamed. A lot of press came out because of his extravagant spending. Um, he, he got the nickname, The Piggy, which I think is mean because <laughs> he's kind of a chubby looking dude. Right. <laughs> and I, that's not what they were talking. I guess they could have called him anything else, but I think it might be so partly based on his appearance. So I'm going to apologize for saying it. Um, he kind of had pretty humble roots, though. Um, he was born, he grew up in Newark, New Jersey. His mother worked um, for the Newark Police Department. She was a school crossing guard, which I can't imagine is a very high-paying job, right? Oh, wow. And his and his father was a, a bus driver. 
So that's not usually where CEOs come from, by the way. No, he's way on the outside. They're usually from doctors. Yeah, they're usually from doctors and lawyers, and and they were his parents were a second generation Polish American, so they weren't that immigrant thing. There, so that kind of that, that kind of immigrant work ethic can sometimes wash out over a couple generations, right? Right. Well, he he must fall into our twelve percent that did not have the the immediate college opportunity then. Yeah. And he, he attended Seton Hall University, which is a good school. It's a Catholic school. It's a good school. Um, he joined Tycho in 1975, a year after I was born. And he became CEO, and I thought this was kind of kind of telling too, in 1992. So he didn't just show up like some hot shot, you know, ringer. Okay. He worked his way up. That's a long time. That's an overnight success. That's 18 years, 17 years, whatever. Um. So he did his diamond Tyco. So I think he knew that company like the back of his hand. Okay. Now he he became very famous and very aggressive and got a lot of press because he was they call him Deal a Day Dennis. He was out buying all kinds of companies and he was buying companies that he didn't know a lot about. I mean, he was just very very offensive, aggressive in the in the workplace in the business place. But he started to get some attention for the way he was spending his money. Um, he had Tyco pay for a, and this is in 1992, a $30 million New York apartment. <laughs> now, I don't know where Joe buys his his shower curtains. I'm going to guess it's at, you know, Kroger, Walmart. Where, where, where do you buy your shower curtains at, Joe? I wait for other people to get rid of theirs, and then I, I stitch them together. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with goodwill on that one. I'll give you goodwill. So, how much would you spend on a shower curtain? What's your budget on something like that? Uh, um, honestly, under fifty bucks. Like it, it's. I, I joke about having a shower curtain quilt, but no, it's it's. I, I get them off Amazon like anyone else. Well, Dennis the piggy, his shower curtains in his New York apartment are six thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> Wait, are you saying yours aren't? You... <laughs> Now, if you walk in the door, you need a nice umbrella stand. He had a specially designed dog umbrella stand, and that was that was fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> okay. And I could go on and on about what he spent it all his money on, but there's 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 two things that there's two things that really crack me up. Um, he had a party, a private party, that ended up costing two million dollars. Um, he also had a party where he hired for a private musician, Jimmy Buffett. Do you know Jimmy Buffett is, Joe? Yeah, and I can't imagine that's cheap. Like I've I've heard of CEOs doing this, where they will hire somebody who is like huge name. I mean, like yeah, Jim, and Jimmy Buffett's he sings Margaritaville, but he's a very shrewd businessman. He's marketed to restaurants. He's you know, and he's worth a half a billion dollars himself. So to have him come play at your house in front of your buddies, it starts from one million to one point five million. To have Jimmy Buffett just come over. <laughs> I so this is not like hiring, uh, you know, way a underestimated band. <laughs> Margaritaville there. Okay, <laughs> yeah, he's the man's a very shrewd businessman. He doesn't get out of bed for much, you know. Um, he's in the billionaire club himself almost. Um, the one that really got a lot of bad press for him was he threw a he threw a, a birthday party for his wife, and it was a weekend long. It was a two million dollar affair. And it was it got the nickname, um, the t- the Tycho Roman orgy, <laughs> and and I, we're gonna put links to this. And you showed up at this, and they ha- you had Roman guards escort escort you in, and they were feeding you grapes. They rented fig trees. It was absolutely stupid, absolutely stupid. And this was in two thousand two, and he finally got busted for he had. Um, I can't even pronounce these art stuff. I don't know anything about art, but he was buying very expensive art. Oh, Renoir, Monet. Um, okay, yeah, that's Ren- crazy. Renoir and Monet's in the twelve million dollars range. So he was—that's exactly what got him was his obsession with collecting art. And of course, he had Tycho pay for it because he can't pay for it with his ridiculous salary. And to me, that just reeks of stupidity. Yeah, I'm gonna steal things when I have enough money to buy it myself. I just don't want to spend it, my money on that. I'd rather spend the company's, and they're so lucky to have me. I've made everyone so rich. This is just a 
to me, this is ego out of control. Now, tell me if this sounds crazy when I make this comparison, but I have heard. <clears throat> um, so I, I, I had a um, my aunt used to work at a craft store, and I found out that a lot of the people that shoplift, shoplifted there were not um, people who were hurting for money. Oftentimes, the shoplifters were um, people who were well off. And they were frequent customers. They just felt like they had earned it. Like they, they were like, oh, I, I come here so often. I deserve to, you know, I've spent so much money here. I, I deserve this bag of, you know, you know, expensive beads or, or you know. Cut. It's, their, <laughs> it's their own rebate thing. Yeah. They're just right. like, hey, you guys are lucky. I've spent this. I earned at least this. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I almost. The, no, their own, re, their own private rewards program is what it is. Right. So it, it feels to me like a sense of entitlement. Like. Like this, a ty- you know, for Tycho, it sounds like Dennis really actually did come up through the ranks, earned them a ton of money. Like the amount of companies he absorbed and and enriched Tycho with is crazy. Like like he was a a a, a oh. kingdom maker. So, and they were wise decisions, business sense wise. He did really well. And that's what was one of his big things too was 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 how much success he had. He wasn't buying foolishly. He was spending personal wealth foolishly. But for the company, he was he was very uh, a very brilliant businessman. Right. So it's just a case of the CEO thought he was the business. I mean that 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 kind of is going to ring over and over again as we talk about this. Is this is the case of somebody who thought they were entitled, felt like they had earned it, and they believed they were the organization they had built it's not just they built an organization it's this thing is me i i get to control it i don't care how successful are you shouldn't have two million dollar birthday parties for your wife that are roman orgies i just can't i mean this is too far i just clicked on the picture you know i can i can see you there vomiting and then re-eating some more chicken i can see you at the were you at that party where were you (laughs) (laughs) joe this is right up your alley I think we'd be staff there. We'd probably be slaves that were being whipped for their for their uh, <laughs> for their amusement. We'd, that would be our role. They'd they'd give us uh, dull swords, and we'd have to fight in a gladiator arena for them. <laughs> and we'd have to bleed outside, right. so we didn't get anything on on the mo- no. Hey, don't splatter any blood on the Monet. <laughs> If anyone thinks we're making this up, go look at the pictures. It is literally a Roman orgy. Like, like it's just straight up. It, it's almost like somebody, it's a party someone would throw to make fun of rich people, but it is rich people doing it. So it's it's crazy. And you can see you can see everyone there with this really stupid smile on their face. Yeah. You know. And let's face it, I, th- I think those kind of parties, any kind of orgies are for 20-year-olds, not, uh, not 40, 50, 60-year-olds. Let's keep all those people's clothes on, okay? Right. <laughs> Yeah, you hire young people to, to do the stripping. Kozlowski's excesses were revealed in excruciating detail. The $15,000 doggy umbrella stand. That $6,000 shower curtain. And then there was the 40th birthday party for Kozlowski's wife, Karen, in Sardinia. A four-day festival of flesh. So, you know, what... What did the trial look like? What what did he justify all of this greed with? That's interesting. The trial went down, and the, that's very funny. The first trial was a mistrial because one of the jurors was seen giving a thumbs up, okay sign towards Dennis Piggy. Oh. <laughs> so they said, "What?" So oh. we're like, "What the hell?" They're in cahoots. And it was incredibly embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Dennis got sentenced to prison. And it was Lincoln Correction Facility in New York. And this is more like, this is nicer than any apartment I've ever lived in. It was a pretty cushy stay. <laughs> and they immediately, immediately put him in protective custody um, because it would have been real, you know, a real notch on your belt to kill um, a big CEO like that. So they, they took care of him. He was protected. He said he, didn't, he never felt in danger at any time. And one of his buddies in jail who was there on a gun charge was rapper J. Roll, J. Rule. Oh, Jarul. Ja Rule. <laughs> ja Rule, ja Rule. I'm sorry, I just the name wrong. Yeah, he and they were buddies. They used to hang out and talk, and he used to give stock tips. This reminds <laughs> me of Bertie Madoff. He gave stock tips to everyone. So this was a very. This is not, you know. Um, he his first parole was denied, but then he was actually then he was granted parole in, in 2017. He got out. 
Um, the state of New York filed against him that $500 million in compensation that he received between 97 and 2002 had to be forfeited. So he lost everything. Um, it turns out under his, his um, watch, the company, Tyco, lost $3.55 billion. So that's a pretty big hit. Um, but today... He lives a much different life than he used to. He doesn't have the, the you know, the, the Bentleys and the, the drivers and the helicopters. He actually rides a subway. Um, instead of six thousand dollars shower curtains, he gets his shower curtains from Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> and his wife's ring, um, it's a, what do you call it? It's a zoo, uh, cubic zirconium. What do they call that? Oh yeah, cubic zirconium. Yeah. It's under $300, and his new wife, his third wife, added, and that comes with free shipping. <laughs> uh, their, their Roman orgy party is going to look so much cheaper. Like, they're, that's going to come from Party City. It's going to be cardboard armor for the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> party City. <laughs> For most of us, the dream of extreme wealth is one of security. In this economy, we fantasize less about yachts and mansions and more about a world where you don't need a full-time job to cover life-saving surgery or a monthly rent that isn't over half your paycheck. But what if you had all your basic necessities covered? Wealth may start as security, but what happens when you grow into your fortune? Then wealth becomes a scorecard. How do the fabulously wealthy really think? People are all different. If they're arrogant, they may think they earned it by being there first. If they're confident, they blame their extremely niche skills, which societies decide to reward them for. Or, like most people, the wealthy might see themselves as heroes of their own narrative, with one fundamental difference. The rest of us merely believe we're the heroes of our own story because that's how humans work. Whereas the fabulously wealthy have an actual scorecard telling them they're the hero of their own story. One that's issued by the bank and the rest of the world generally seems to agree with their metric. You've been listening to The Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com. That's where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for each of our episode. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. Mm-hmm.